good evening, everybody. My name is Jacob Fleming. I'm the chair of the Neurointerventional Service Line for the RFS. Uh, today, I'm excited to welcome back Dr. Martin Redvani. He's a dual trained body IR and neurointerventional radiologist, um, very active in society, and we're excited to have him back. He presented a version of this talk last year, and we're excited to see hear about his updates. Uh, and so briefly about Dr. Radvani, he completed medical school at Northwestern University before completing internship and then residency in radiology at Tripler Armley Medical Center, then com completed a fellowship in interventional radiology at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he was then in the Army for some time. He was the chief of interventional radiology at Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio. And he decided in 2007 to return and upgrade his skill set. Went for a fellowship in interventional neuroradiology again at Johns Hopkins and stayed on for faculty there for some time. He then went to York, Pennsylvania, where he established an interventional neuroradiology program at Wellspan Hospital. And uh, since then, he's moved to University of Arkansas for medical science, and he is the chief of interventional neuroradiology there. Uh, he's also a professor. Uh, radiology and neurosurgery, and he's, as I said, very active in the Society of Interventional Radiology in both the um, stroke program, which is presented annually at SIR for uh, practicing attendees, and is very involved with the effort to train interventional radiologists going forward to be uh, successful neurointerventionalists as well. And what he's going to talk about tonight is some of the pathways for interventional radiologists to gain experience with cerebral angiography, stroke work, and comprehensive uh, neurointerventional fellowship training. Uh, there's a lot of questions in this area, and so I think this is going to be a very insightful talk, and we're excited to have you, Dr. Radvani. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, so these are my disclosures, and this is kind of what I'm going to cover this evening. So kind of review what's going on with the training pathways, because I know that's of great interest to a lot of people. Uh, talk about what the current pathways are and really where we're gonna, what I foresee as the future um, and things we've been working towards and kind of how we're getting there. Um, so this is a review from the SIR website that shows the current IR training pathways. And you can see the, uh, you know, we're coming online here with, we have the integrated IR residency, which is, you know, is in, uh, I can't remember, it's been going on for a couple of years now, and it has become one of the most competitive uh, residencies. Uh, I came up through the traditional pathway, uh, but when I did it, it was actually a two-year fellowship uh, in IR. So I did my PGY six and seven years uh, before I went off to, uh, to the Army to be an interventional radiologist. Um, then there's the independent uh, IR residency, um, the traditional pathway is going to be phased out in 2020, and then what's going to take over is the independent IR residency or the independent IR residency with uh, the early career uh, ESIR. So, the, you know, so there will still be the option of doing the traditional diagnostic radiology residency and then two years of training afterwards, which is going to be similar to what I did, or for those programs that offer it, coming in doing the uh, starting to do the IR rotations during the first five years and then having that potentially that six year of uh, residency so basically shaving off a year so it would just be six years postgraduate training um, one of the questions is uh, you know how do you if you are interested in neuro how do you get there um, so currently um, there's the ACGME pathway, and this is this is a pathway that's been around for many years, and there are pathways there for, um, you know, for radiology, for neurosurgery, as well as neurology, and what that would consist of is similar to going in the traditional pathway where the IR residency, I mean the IR fellowships, you know, you have your internship, then your radiology residency. Uh, that takes you to your PGY-5 year. During that time, you need to have, the idea is that then you'll go into your diagnostic neuroradiology fellowships, and somewhere during this time, during residency and the, and the neuroradiology fellowship, you would have acquired 100 
cerebral angiograms of some sort. And during those previous six years, uh, I mean, previous five years or six years, um, you get six months of neuro training. So neurologic surgery, vascular neurology, neurointensive care. And the idea being that you actually understand the care for these patients, uh, similar to what's going on with the IR, uh, you know, the IR residency where you spend a lot of time doing clinical work up front. And then you have your interventional neuroradiology fellowship. So what does that look like time-wise? Well, we have the integrated IR residency we've talked about, then the independent residency, and then the independent residency with the ESIR. The neuro IR pathway, and this is just if you came up the traditional pathway, that you had eight years. So you have your diagnostic radiology, that requirement for neuroradiology, and then the two, one to two, but most people, it's really two uh, INR years. Um, what is happening that has changed the, the scope of this and kind of caught everybody's attention is that diagnostic neuroradiology is going to be dropping the requirement for uh, diagnostic cerebral angiography during the fellowship. So what is the pathway going to look like in the future for radiologists? Because if you're not doing cerebral angiography during your, your that fellowship, when are you going to do it? Um, when I was a fellow, we actually did a lot of cerebral angiography. We were doing three to five cerebral angiograms a week. And I was when I was as a fellow in body IR. Things have changed with other specialties getting into the area. And so the opportunities for that are less and less. Um, and I think one of the one of my big issues or one of my big things that I've been pushing for, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself, is but we need to have radiologists continue being involved in uh, interventional neuroradiology and performing cerebral angiography. So where is the logical place for that to continue happening? Well, if it's not going to be in the diagnostic neuroradiology area, I think IR is where it belongs. So with keeping that in mind, let's uh, talk a little bit more about what the training requirements are for neuro IR. And so we have the formal training in neurosciences that we talked about, which is about six months during, and that can be done during residency or as part of the fellowship. Um, you need the skill set, obviously. Um, and you know, as being an interventional radiologist, going back to training, in my case, it was after 10 years. Um, the transition was actually, uh, from a catheter skill standpoint, was pretty straightforward because I had used microcatheters, I had used these, you know, the 014, the small wires, um, I had catheterized some very challenging anatomy uh, in patients. And so that was not really the issue. It's this formal portion here of the neuroscience and pathophysiology training. That was the part where I really had to uh, do a lot of learning. Um, and that's what I spent a lot of time in my fellowship uh, working on. And if you can achieve that beforehand, that really sets you in a good stead for going on and doing neurointerventional. Um, and then this whole idea of being able to recognize and manage complications. So the training guidelines back in 2009, uh, which uh, are being updated, we've actually finished updating those as one of the SIRA writing groups, um, but they basically, a lot of this stuff has stayed the same. And it's having performed 100 cerebral angiograms prior to starting endovascular training, having the clinical skill set to manage the patients six months, and then understanding the night stroke scale. Because if you're going to treat stroke, you really have to understand and be able to discuss uh, stroke in the language that the neurologists are discussing it. Just as with any disease process, if you're doing treating the liver with Y90 or you know, taste, you have to be able to talk about the liver. You have to know the anatomy. You have to understand the segments. You have to understand the risks and the benefits of the various procedures and how to manage these patients. And the same thing goes for stroke. So if we look at what the ACG training pathways are for all the specialties, we start with our internship, you know, radiology, you have your diagnostic radiology, your neuroradiology, and then your two years. That takes you somewhere out to somewhere around eight years. For the neurosurgeons, they have their internship, I, their neurosurgical training, and then the neuroradiology, the ACGMA pathway recommends a year, um, and then the one or two years of endovascular. So that could even potentially be out to 10 years. On the neurology side, they have their internship, neurology, cerebrovascular fellowship, neuroradiology training, 
and then the endovascular uh, general surgical training portion of it. And these are pretty long pathways. Um, if you look at that and add that, how would that look on top of the current pathways that we have with IR residency? Nine years. I mean, that's just not going to happen. Uh, you know, there are very few of us who are going to uh, do that. I was one of the few people because I didn't get enough punishment my first time who went back to fellowship after 10 years, but most people are not going to be able to take this route. So how is this, you know, how is this going to work? Now, if you actually look at it in practice, what's happening? You saw all those years that I showed you that the various specialties would have to do it, but that training pathway has been around for over a decade now. However, there are only, as of last month when I double-checked it, there are only six programs that are ACGME accredited. Three radiology programs, two neurosurgical, and one neurology program. So here we have all these fellowships pumping out people that are, in essence, not accredited by the ACGME. What has happened in the meantime is the neurosurgical societies um, have gotten together with radiology and uh, neurology, and they have proposed something called the CAS certification. And what that is is a alternative pathway versus the ACGME. And the reason that really came about from what I understand initially is because of all these uncertified programs. Um, now there are actually 35 programs, I don't know that all of them are neurosurgical programs, that are CAS certified. So clearly there is another mechanism here for certification of a training program um, that is coming about because the ACGME pathway is really kind of onerous if you look at it, um, and in some ways not practical. Um, so what do, what do the CAS training guidelines recommend? Well, 200 catheter-based angiograms um, as primary operator before even beginning training. Uh, for a neuroendovascular fellowship, you can see the list of procedures here. The ones I kind of highlight are the intracranial or extracranial stent placements, because I think extracranial stenting is part of the IR, is part of IR. Uh, when I was a body IR fellow, I did carotid stenting at the carot in the cervical portion, not intracranial, but uh, extracranial, you know, carotid revascularization procedures, those that compete directly with uh, and are direct to me. Um, and then acute ischemic stroke, and you can see the numbers here. Um, these are, are really relevant for interventional radiologists in this new climate with the CAS certification because uh, what is starting to happen is that to treat stroke, there are uh, the, uh, the JCO uh, is recommending that uh, operators have some kind of training based along the lines of the CAS certification so that there's a minimum level of competency. And then you can see the other uh, case volumes here that are recommended. In addition to that, and this is where the radiologists have a distinct advantage, is the interpretation of these studies. So brain imaging, when you do your neuroradiology rotations and you take call at night at a busy training program, you are easily going to read 200 non-contrast head CTs, MRIs, MRI angiograms, perfusion studies. That's, you know, that's not even going to be a challenge to get those. Interpretation of the cerebral angiograms and performing angiograms, that's what's going to be a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, what, you can, what you see here is these are the new guidelines that have actually been proposed within the draft of the training guidelines that is under review right now for SIR. And the recommendation there are 200 selective vascular catheterizations. But if you read more closely, 50 of those are cerebral angiograms. The remainder of those are the kinds of procedures, super selective microcatheter procedures, procedures in the head and neck that I would expect people doing a IR fellowship to have experience with. This one is going to be a little bit of a challenge with cerebral angiography because it's fallen out of many programs and the question and what's going on right now is seeing how we can reintegrate this requirement back into interve uh, interventional radiology residencies and fellowships. Uh, now that it's being dropped on the neuro uh, diagnostic neuroradiology fellowship side. But 100 super selective catheter angiogram, microcatheter angiograms, if you think of all the procedures that are performed, embolizations of the liver, spleen, kidneys, um, uterine fibroid embolizations, these all involve microcatheter work. So 
even though that looks like a daunting number, it really isn't. It, this is something that should easily be achievable um, during a uh, IR uh, residency and fellowship. Carotid bifurcation revascularization, so that's gonna be a little bit more of a challenge. And then the 30 cerebrovascular thrombectomy procedures. This is something um, that is, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about when we were working on these guidelines. And we have, uh, there were people on the writing group from, uh, with various experience levels, some of them in their first or second year out of training um, who were participating at stroke thrombectomy. And this is uh, how we really arrived at this number, as well as uh, discussing the numbers in the uh, training guidelines from the CAST uh, certification side. Um, and the younger members of the writing group really felt that this was an appropriate number to become comfortable uh, with uh, performing uh, stroke thrombectomy procedures. So even though those numbers look daunting, I think from the brain imaging standpoint, um, at least the, on the diagnostic portion of it, uh, this should be, you know, diagnostic cerebral angiograms, that may be a little bit of a challenge, but the rest of the non-invasive imaging, that is very easily achievable. So uh, the carotid stenting guidelines, this goes back to, again, 2009. You know, you see the same things that we discussed, uh, neurocognitive neuroscience training, uh, again, because you can cause a stroke while you're doing a uh, carotid revascularization, so you really need to know what the signs are, and then how to initiate therapy potentially. Um, getting 100 diagnostic cerebral angiograms, and then uh, the pathway for non carotid procedures, you know, having the uh, training, and then the recommendation was 10 consecutive supervised uh, procedures. So you can see it's not really that different from what has been being proposed almost a decade ago. So, how would this look moving forward if what has happened? And what drives this is the center section here in neurosurgery, what they've done is um, with the CAS certification, they've infolded their fellowships. So they've moved that what would happen in the PGY eight, eight and or nine, seven, eight or nine year, they've brought it into their residency program and made it infolded. So leaving a seven year um, pathway. In neurology, they have kind of changed things as well. They've gone from their internship and they've just now have their cerebrovascular uh, fellowship as prerequisite to going into uh, training on interventional procedures. Again, bringing them to a seven years. So why does it not make sense for radiologists who already have catheter skills? These other groups are catheter naive. You know, if you've got an IR residency or an IR fellowship, you already know how to work with this equipment. So the technical portion is really not going to be um, the challenging part. It's learning more of the anatomy, the physiology, and should you or should you not do something? And that's really kind of the more important portion of it. So potentially, um, and there are programs uh, that are doing this. Um, I've trained some people who went through programs through their internship, their diagnostic radiology, and completed their IR fellowship where they had a significant amount of experience, three months doing neurovascular procedures, and then came uh, when I was at Hopkins and did a formal one year neurointerventional fellowship. And these people, you know, those who did it were very prepared when they went out. They had the skills, they were very capable. So I don't see, you know, from the radiology standpoint, from a technical standpoint, this is something that is very achievable. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about what's going on right now to achieve that. So I'm going to take a little detour here, uh, talk about stroke care. Um, right now, it's a really hot topic. There are with all the studies coming out, we have more and more people who are potentially uh, could benefit from having stroke therapy. Now with the the studies uh, Dawn and Diffuse using image-based selection, we're treating patients out to 24 hours, and I would say potentially even longer if they have a good imaging profile. I mean, what's the difference between 24 hours and 25 hours if the perfusion study looks good? So I think it's really we've gone from a time-based uh, Met, uh, evaluation of these patients too. It's really driven by imaging. So understanding the imaging work of these patients is very important. And for a radiologist, you know, in training at a program that has a stroke program, shouldn't be an issue. But what we have now is the stroke care organization in the United States. So we have stroke ready hospitals who can give TPA and usually transfer these patients to a hospital such as a primary stroke center or something 
higher up for continued care after that so the patients can be monitored for complications. Primary stroke centers um, really are the core of what exists around the country right now. A lot of places that can give TPA and watch a patient afterwards. What um, the important part is that of those of stroke patients, about 30% roughly, it's been estimated, will actually have a large vessel occlusion. So those are the patients that you need to get to a hospital like a thrombectomy ready stroke center or a comprehensive stroke center. Uh, the difference being that the thrombectomy stroke center is really primarily dedicated to dealing with stroke versus the comprehensive stroke center that takes all um, all the all neurovascular cases to include the full spectrum of hemorrhagic strokes, so intracranial hemorrhage, uh, ruptured aneurysms, and so that's kind of the next level. But for any of these uh, certifications, uh, the reason it becomes important is that CAST thing. So there's a lot going on right now that's been going on in the past year of uh, looking at this certification and discussing, you know, how can a radiologist be uh, eligible to have this kind of training? Clearly, not everybody can be a neurointerventionalist. There's just not enough cases from a pragmatic standpoint. The number of aneurysms, AVMs, things like that is not going to change. It's been steady for the last 20, 30 years since we've been doing endovascular therapy. What has exploded are the number of patients with stroke. And so a lot of IR practices especially are looking for individuals who are willing to do this because this is really something that we don't have enough of. We don't have enough people who can treat stroke right now. And stroke is probably one of the few things other than trauma that gets me out of bed in the middle of the night. So stroke call can be brutal. Um, and that's why you really need uh, more people who can do this. The other challenge is uh, getting patients to a center where they can actually be treated. Um, if you look, you do a heat map of the uh, United States and you look at where stroke centers are versus the patient population, once you start getting away to more rural states, so those in the Southeast, um, those in the middle of the, the United States, Southwest, you know, basically once you get away from both coasts and the major cities like Chicago or St. Louis, the ability to get patients to one of these centers that has the, you know, the assets in place to really provide care for these patients goes down very, very quickly. So there's a lot of discussion of, well, just transfer the patient. Uh, here in uh, Little Rock, we're, we're smack dab in the middle of the state. What I can tell you is during the winter time and even during the springtime, the weather here is terrible. So flying patients is not an option. You know, everybody says, oh, just put them on a helicopter. Well, that's great during the summer when the weather is nice, but the reality of it is what, the weather doesn't always cooperate. And so there needs to be more availability um, of, play, of hospitals and places that can do this. And my belief after being an IR for 10 years and then retraining um, is very clear that I, you know, body interventionalists have the skill set to do this. And with some, you know, increased training during their, during the IR residency and fellowship, uh, achieving the, those prerequisites and then getting the training necessary to teach, to treat stroke is very achievable during an IR, uh, during uh, IR training. If you want to go on to do more uh, exotic things like glue AVMs, uh, coil brain aneurysms, you really need to do another year of fellowship. And so one of the things that uh, we've been working on, um, SIR has been working on, is how to achieve all of these goals. So in the past year, we've been doing a lot of things. So the stroke training guidelines from 2009, uh, there was a working group that I uh, alluded to. Um, and that has, those guidelines have been rewritten. Um, they are currently undergoing a review uh, through the Society of Interventional Radiology through the various committees. Um, SIR has been offering a stroke course, which was, a, this year was the fourth year. We had uh, 78 people, I believe, this year, and we've been averaging roughly that many people every year. The course is expanded now to 1.1 1 .1 and a half days. Um, we actually moved the 
uh, stroke imaging session out of the stroke course into the general meeting at SIR because at many hospitals, if you go out into private practice, uh, at some of the smaller hospitals, even if you're not treating stroke, it's the interventionalists who, you know, you guys look at all the peripheral vascular stuff, you can look at this brain too. And if you don't have a dedicated fellowship trained neuroradiologist in the practice, a lot of that's going to fall to the IRs. And I've seen that. Um, so the that session has been moved to the general meeting as a good review, um, and we had some really great speakers this past year. Um, the stroke course also uh, offers a CME credit, so if you're treating stroke, you need to have eight hours of stroke CME a year, and the course achieves that. So that's one of the things that uh, has been happening at the SIR level. Um, this fall, we're going to have a stroke imaging boot camp that's starting off. It's going to be at the ACR uh, uh, headquarters in Virginia, just like the other courses that are there. There's the MAMO boot camp, uh, there's the neurology mini fellowship, I mean, neuro, neuro radiology mini fellowship, as well as probably 10 other courses. And so, what uh, SIR is doing is creating a course with the content so that when you looked at those requirements, 100, you know, interpretation of 100 diagnostic cerebral angiograms. Um, looking at perfusion studies and so forth, if you didn't get it in training, here's this course will provide that. Um, it will provide the cases that can be reviewed with faculty who are there in small groups um, providing that training. So if you didn't get enough of that during your, uh, or feel comfortable with it or want a refresher for people who are coming out of training, that course is, uh, will be in its first year this fall. And starting off, uh, people who attend it will review a minimum of 50 cases, stroke cases, starting with the original non-contrast head CT, then the perfusion imaging, the CT angiography, then the cerebral angiograms that go across, uh, go with the case, you know, discuss the findings there, and then even the post-procedure imaging, looking at this follow-up CTs, MRs, as well as the complications that go with it, with discussions of what do you actually do with this. Uh, if there is a complication. So there is, you know, it's going to be a pretty robust course that will help meet uh, those requirements for people who are out in practice and may not have had uh, adequate numbers of cases during their uh, residencies or fellowships. Um, as far as the IR residency curriculum, there have been many meetings going on between the ACGME, the uh, program directors, uh, SIR leadership, and what uh, I kind of talked about that a little bit, um, but the plan is to try and incorporate cerebral angiography back, make it a requirement of IR training at the residency and fellowship level, uh, especially since it's not going to any longer be a requirement in diagnostic neuroradiology. And so we need to keep that practice in the house of radiology. You know, otherwise, there is no pathway really for radiologists who want to do neuro to uh, get there. And, uh, you know, in addition to cerebral angiography, carotid stenting, and stroke training, uh, integrate those back into the IR residency. And I, and I believe that can be successfully done. Here at UAMS, we're actually I'm working with Dr. Uh, Molly Meek, who's the director of the IR residency as well as the IR fellowship. And we're working on a curriculum and rotations here so that residents will have the six months of uh, cognitive training that they need to have. Um, to treat stroke, and then they will be rotating on the neurointerventional service so that they will have, uh, they will get the training um, they need to successfully uh, treat stroke patients as well as uh, do carotid stenting. Um, one of the unique things we have here is a, uh, we also have the neurosurgical residents who rotate with us, and I think it's a very beneficial cross pollination um, because most of the neurosurgical residents really, they're not going to go into neurovascular. Okay, um, out of 14 uh, residents, you know, you'll maybe find one who's interested, unless there's very unique situations at that institution. Um, it's kind of because neurovascular neurosurgery is kind of a labor of love. Uh, doing an open aneurysm uh, takes a lot of time. You could probably do two or three laminectomies in the same time. So, you know, it's not a, really a lot uh, of, I would say, competition from that standpoint. But it makes a very unique environment because the radiology residents who round in the ICU with the neurosurgical teams learn a lot about patient management when they're on the rotations with us. Um, and then vice versa uh, with 
the uh, neurosurgery residents learn a lot about imaging. Um, and so finally, uh, the IR, NIR pathway for IR residents, um, you know, that's still kind of being worked out, but my vision is kind of what I described, where I think IR residents who realize early on that they are really interested in doing neurointerventional, ultimately, they can definitely gain the skill set uh, as well as the cognitive training, uh, you know, that they need so that when it's, when they're applying to the uh, neuro fellowships, they have all the skills that they're going to need to be successful. And that is about all I have this evening. So I think uh, we'll open the floor to questions. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Radvani. It was very informative and exciting to hear about everything that's going on. Um, as Dr. Radvani said, we'll open it up for questions now. If anybody would like, we'll give a few minutes. Um, you can post in the questions tab or the chat tab, uh, and we'll take those. Um, one question I'd like to pose first, and I actually asked this, uh, I think a couple years ago at the SIR meeting. Um, one thing that I think is on the mind of a lot of people is uh, call, obviously stroke call is um, demanding as you've alluded to, um, and body IR call can be its own beast as well. And so uh, one question I have is how can those two call pools kind of be managed by, by one person? Um, so for example, um, is it possible to take both calls at once? How would that vary kind of based on what institution you're at? And um, what, what's your current situation kind of like? And what, what have you heard of or what are people doing in these kind of practices? Okay, well, I'll start with the easy one. The easy one is, can you do both at once? And the answer is not if you're at a JCO or probably any certified center. So if you're on stroke call, you are on you're on neurovascular call. So you're primarily stroke, but if they're, you know, the good part is aneurysms, things like that. If you're not doing the full spectrum and you have somebody who is doing those, you don't have to come in the middle of the night to do an aneurysm. Those can wait. The only things that you really have to do on neuro are, um, trauma and stroke. In general, everything else can wait till the sun comes back up. So at least from a, you know, being up all night standpoint, it makes things a little bit easier. Um, but that kind of answers the question a little bit. So, you know, you're going to have to have a rotation for those people who are doing stroke call. And then kind of, you're going to have the other rotation for, now this isn't a certified center. You know, if you're going to be certified, one of the certification bodies, you kind of have to be available for that. Um, if you were, you know, here, we're fortunate where I, uh, here at UMS, um, we have actually kind of an interesting setup because we have four IRs at the university. I think we also have three, if not four at the VA uh, across the street. And for call purposes, they cover each other. So the call there is Q8. Um, for the neuro uh, interventionalists here, there are three of us. So our call is actually Q3. If we had, you know, if the bot, if any of the body people were to be integrated into the call in our into our call pool, um, they clearly wouldn't be able to be taking call on the um, on the body or peripheral side. Um, having said that, uh, you know, it is there is the potential to negotiate, um, especially if you're in private practice. Um, there are private practice groups where they have, you know, very successfully negotiated for call pay, um, which helps defer some of the pain of call. Um, part of it also is, you know, really seeing what your institution can do. Um, and even more importantly, the one thing I will tell you right now is you don't want to be the Lone Ranger doing call. You, and what I mean by that is not just you don't want to be the only person doing thrombectomy. You don't want to be the only person there doing stroke. I have seen uh, other hospitals where interventionalists from all backgrounds, um, you know, body, you know, from radiology, from neurosurgery, from neurology. And what's key is that you have a team. So here at our hospital, we currently have three. And I think by this summer, we'll have four stroke neurologists that just take stroke call. Well, for every 
15 phone calls they get, I only get one. You don't want to be the frontline person. That's what I'm talking about being the Lone Ranger. You know, if you are getting all those phone calls, getting woken up all night long, yeah, you're going to burn out in a year at most. And I've seen, I've seen plenty of practices where young, uh, peop, you know, young people have come out of training, gone to a practice that, yeah, I'm going to do everything. And within one year, maybe two, they're gone. They've left the practice. They've moved somewhere else because they've realized this is not sustainable. Um, you know, Q1 call where you're taking care of everything. I've done it. I did it for uh, about eight months when I was at Wellspan. <laughs> it went to Q2, and that was night and day. And even Q2 is is not sustainable. You really need to have about three people taking call, if not four. I know that was a long-winded answer. Uh, I hope it answered the question, though. Yes, it did. Thank you. Uh, obviously. A complex situation and uh, something that will have to be kind of worked out on a case-by-case -case basis is uh, essentially what that comes down to, but um, important not to be burnt out with the demands of stroke call on top of other responsibilities too. Absolutely. And and that's I think that's part of, you know, also, you know, as IR evolves, um, you know, so in some groups, you know, it depends on the needs of the group, how big the group is, you know, are you doing pure IR, are you doing diagnostic NIR, um, and really, the, you know, the institution and the radiology group need to support you, uh, because it's not sustainable otherwise. All right. All right. Uh, so, we've got a few questions here. Uh, we'll just take them in the order in which they came in. Uh, so, first, Daniela Garcia asks, is it possible to be part of the neuro boot camp during PGY one? Oh, abso absolutely. I mean, it, it, you can sign up for that, and the course is open to everybody. Um, so uh, anybody can come to that course. It's a weekend course. It's going to be November first and second, and it's going to be a pretty intense two days. But anyone's welcome to it. Um, you know, you want to have a certain background coming into it. Um, will definitely help if you have some experience, but it's, uh, yeah, anybody, it's open to anybody. Perfect. Yeah. And I, I think the one, that's the one that's taking place in Virginia, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yep. Right. That's the ACR, uh, uh, teaching center, I believe in Reston. Yeah. And the, the, those links can be found on the SIR website, I believe, uh, saw it just the other day. Uh, and registration is open if I'm not mistaken. Um, it is. Next question, uh, we'll go first one from uh, Alexander Sidor. Sidor, sorry if I mispronounced that. He asks, what should I be doing as an integrated IR resident to help establish an integrated NIR pathway at my institution? Well, the first thing is to get buy-in from the, uh, you know, from the program director and the folks who are involved. I think one of the bigger biggest challenges um, you know, is getting the cerebral angiography and those procedures, getting the time to be able to rotate in neuro IR, especially if it's not integrated in the program at this point. So I think it's really reaching out to the, uh, the, the uh, faculty in those areas and indicating an interest and then talking about, you know, how can we get there? Um, and as I said, here at UAMS, what we're doing is we're actually organizing formal rotations for the for the residents, um, you know, all the IR residents and then the and then the IR fellows are going to have time in neuro IR, and the IR residents are actually having the time to do you know get the neurocognitive. They're uh, I've been working with Dr. Meek. She's actually been working pretty hard at juggling the schedule to figure out how to shoehorn those six months of training in there, because with all the other requirements, it's a little bit of a challenge, but it can be done. Great. And next question, I apologize in advance. I will absolutely butcher your name, so apologies. Muchipe um, Mpoy asks, will neuroradiology to INR pathway be stopped ultimately? Will residents in DR have to do IR fellowship before INR? You know, Thank you. I, in this lecture. That's a great question. And the answer is I don't know at this point in time. And I don't think it's going to happen overnight. 
I, you know, I, that it's not, it's not just going to be like flipping a switch. Okay. What I think is going to happen over time at institutions is if the, if the neuro faculty are interested and they have in doing angiography and interventions, it's going to be, it's going to continue to be viable uh, in that, in those institutions. It really depends on what the faculty are interested in. Um, I have been, you know, I know that in my experience uh, when I was at Hopkins, um, most of the neuro, diagnostic neuroradiology fellows, they had to come rotate with us because they had this requirement. But most of them had no interest whatsoever. They were just as happy to not even change into scrubs. And so that's, I think that's kind of where this um, has come from. Because a lot of the people who are going into diagnostic neuroradiology really are imagers. They're not interventionalists, you know, but clearly there are programs across the country with very experienced neurointerventionalists that are part of their part of the diagnostic neuroradiology department. So it's really as those people retire and the, the flavor of the program changes each institution that I think you're going to see this ebb, you know, in the in uh, people coming from that pathway but it's going to it's it's getting more and more challenging from that standpoint uh, similar to that question i just want to jump off perhaps kind of a corollary you mentioned a lot of the neuroradiology fellows sometimes come in and they're not necessarily interested in getting the experience with the neuro interventions so talking about integrating ir with inr rotations do you think that should maybe be something that's more of an opt-in for interested residents, given that maybe some IR residents are not really interested in, in their career doing neuro interventions, or should it be something that we should, we should expect all uh, interventional radiologists going forward to have a modicum of experience in this? Um, you know, I don't think that has been figured out yet. Um, you know, I know we are being very proactive at our program here at UAMS. I don't know that all programs will feel that way. Um, I think as a minimum, residents and fellows coming out of IR training should know how to do diagnostic cerebral angiography. Um, because what the reality of it is, you leave an academic institution and go into a private practice somewhere, and in most, in many private practices, they don't have interventional, uh, I'm sorry, they don't, uh, the people who end up doing the diagnostic cerebral angiography angiograms are the body IRs. And if you didn't get trained during your fellowship, you get OJT from your partners when you get to where you're going. Um, I think it would be preferable if that if, you know, for people to actually get trained formally during their uh, in fellowships and residencies as I was. So, I think, I, and clearly not all IRs are going to be interested in doing stroke. That's okay. Um, and so I think it's, you know, right now it's trying to figure out, one, how to get the diagnostic radiology back into the IR training, because clearly somebody in radiology needs to be doing it as a minimum. Now, how other programs approach the other procedures, stroke, carotid stenting, and other things, that's going to vary from institution to institution. And really depend on what resources are available and um, what the uh, relationships are, you know, between the various services. Um, and you know, as if you look, you know, from another standpoint, if you look at other institutions, um, interventional oncology. You know, there are some institutions that have tremendous programs. You'll get training at, pro at just about every program, but there are some where you will really get a lot of training in that area. At the same time, you may not get as much in the peripheral vascular area. Okay, you know, it's still part of the training. It's stuff that you need to know, but it's stuff you may not end up practicing when you go out into practice. So I think really the goal is more of to provide uh, physicians of radiology background with a pathway to be involved in this because it is something that's uh, becoming more and more important um, as time goes on. I think, you know, the biggest thing is stroke. The other neurovascular procedures, that's not really the big push right now, um, but it's really on the stroke side just because this is an area where we just don't have enough people right now trained to do it. Great. Uh, second question from Alexander. 
he asks, uh, have there been any recent developments for establishing an IR, NIR integrated residency pathway? I think this is uh, to the point, some of the points you've spoken to that remains to be seen and you've talked about what's going on at your institution. Uh, yeah, and I, uh, it really remains to be seen how things go forward. So on the training side, uh, the program directors, uh, they, you know, surveys have gone out to the various programs to see what they can in fact offer their residents. Because depending again on the environment at each institution, certain things will be possible, certain things will not be possible. Um, you know, with at least the mandate of cerebral and geography being part of a IR fellowship or residency, I think that's essential because to me, cerebral angiography, I mean, if, if you're already doing angiograms of the, you know, subclavian artery, well, the vertebral artery is right there and, uh, you know, so are the carotid arteries. So being able to safely place a catheter into those vessels and at least do a diagnostic cerebral angiogram, I believe is part of IR. Well, I totally agree. Um, and one last question looks like here. We'll leave it open for just a moment, see if we have any more. This one's from Kevin Jiang. He has a great question. He says, okay. what should I be focusing on as a first year medical student if I'm interested in going into INR? What, uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? What should he be focusing on? Yeah, what should he be focusing on as a first year medical student? Well, as a first year medical student, um, I think, you know, it's really, Learning, you know, the learning the anatomy and learning the uh, you know physiology uh, that goes along with uh, neurolog neurovascular disease, um, and looking broadly at the area from the standpoints of neurosurgery, neurology, and radiology, because it's three very different approaches to uh, the neurologic system. And so I think the broader your background is going into it, um, the more uh, opportunities you will have down the road. And you'll also figure out what you like and what you don't like. Um, because it is, you know, if you think about it, people who traditionally go into radiology are a certain group. You are very, Im they're very image oriented. People going into Surgery tend to be much more procedure oriented, but that's kind of changing a little with interventional radiology. It's kind of blurring the line a little bit. If you think of neurologists, it's more, you know, a little bit more cerebral. You know, they, they are, they are, you know, take care of patients. They think about a lot of stuff. But if you think about neurology in general, it's not a very procedure oriented, especially, yes, you have LPs, things like that. But, you know, which of those groups really spends a lot of time doing procedures. So I think part of it is, you know, getting a broad exposure to the various specialties that feed into neuroscience and then understanding what really, um, what piques your interest. Um, you know, because we see it all the time. Uh, I saw people, you know, even when I was in training who were surgical interns and then who switched to radiology and were fantastic radiology residents. And there are people who I've seen who switched, you know, went the other direction. And so I think the more that you explore during medical school, the more experience you get. Um, and I would, you know, if you can do away rotations when you get to your third and fourth year, I found those hugely beneficial because it really opened my eyes to uh, what was going on because at one institution you get a very uh, you get a certain view of how things are and as you get out into the wide world you find out that there's a lot of different ways of doing the same thing and the more experience you have the more different things you've seen it sets you up better to decide on what really interests you and what you can follow um, I hope that answered the question Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to add on to that. I think that's a great question. I, I can relate because um, interventional radiology and interventional neuroradiology was something I developed an early interest in in medical school. Uh, I'm still in the early part of my residency training, but I would just say uh, medical training as a whole is a it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, uh, even though it feels like it a lot of the time. 
Um, and the best advice I ever got is just uh, focus on each task in front of you, whatever rotation or course you're in, uh, focus on that and do your best and uh, try not to get uh, too focused on will I use this, but also keep in mind your your interests, whether that be INR or IR, radiology, anything like that, but always focus on the task at hand and uh, do your best at that. Um, it'll, it'll help uh, to keep you interested going forward. Uh, and last question here is from Alex Logson. Glad to see you, Alex. He asks, is it most common to have the INR fellowship or just IR with on-the-job training? I think. Um, for, uh, okay. No, it's much more common with the IR fellowship and then doing and then having um, some OJT from your partners. Uh, that's currently what's happening. Um, if you look out, you know, if you look out across the landscape, the number of hospitals and the number of IRs that are out there is huge by comparison. So if you take, uh, I'm a member of both uh, Society of Neurointerventional Surgery and SIR, the number of, you know, attending IRs, I believe, is upwards of 3,000 in SIR. SNIS, um, I think, attending, you know, attending physicians, I think the number is somewhere around five or 600. So clearly there are a lot more people on the IR side. Thank you for that. Um, well, thanks for your time, Dr. Radvani. This has been very informative. Thanks for everyone who watched. I hope you learned a lot. I certainly did. And this webinar should be available as a video recording in the next few weeks on the SR YouTube channel. Um, in the meantime, I hope you all keep your eyes posted on SIR Connect. We will be having a few more webinars in the coming weeks related to stroke. And uh, it is May is Stroke Awareness Month. So we wanted to commemorate that and as well tie that into what interventional radiologists are doing in this realm and how we as trainees can be more involved going forward. So keep your eyes peeled for that and uh, hope to see you soon. And again, uh, Dr. Radvani, we're thrilled to have you and uh, thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Okay, all right. Everyone have a good night.